everyone, and welcome to Meet Us on the Abraham Path. I'm Anissa Mehdi, Executive Director of the Abraham Path Initiative. It is so great to see you here from Australia, India, Italy, Turkey, and Boulder, and New York State, and Wisconsin, and other places in the US. I'm with you today, although you can't tell from my background, from the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Abraham Path Initiative inspires and catalyzes the development of walking trails throughout Southwest Asia, a region we commonly call the Middle East. And that's in order to promote connection and conversations among folks who might not have a chance to meet otherwise, to foster economic development through community-based tourism and cultural heritage preservation off the beaten path and experience the rich hospitality of this region hospitality that is often practiced in honor of the legendary prophet, Abraham. And as an online resource for cross-cultural communication and appreciation through programs like this. Along with the first person experience of walking, storytelling is one of the very best ways to get to know other people and other cultures. Today, we are very pleased to introduce Samir Kumsiya, an up and coming Palestinian filmmaker. Samir's work has been seen at film festivals in Toronto, Berlin, Rotterdam, the UK. He's worked with National Geographic, the BBC, and independently, as so many filmmakers do. Joining us from Beit Zahur, just east of Bethlehem, Bethlehem, Palestine, not Pennsylvania, we welcome Samir Kumsiya. How are you today? Hi, Anissa. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's great to see you. Now, first question for you, without giving away too much about the first film of yours that we're going to share with our audience, uh, what turned you on to films and filmmaking, Samir? Well, I think it runs in the family. <laughs> my, uh, my grandfather used to have a camera all the time and my uncle was uh, also like somewhat in the media uh, since I was a kid. Um, he opened a local TV station and stuff like that. But uh, so, yeah, and then somehow I, <laughs> I don't want to give away the film you're going to see, but uh, somehow that camera found, found its way to me. And uh, since I was a kid, I, I was so passionate about filmmaking. So, and so you're a graduate of, of the documentary produc production program at Dar al Kalima uh, University in Bethlehem, near your hometown. Uh, I'm curious what, yeah, I'm also a documentary filmmaker in a previous lifetime, and I'm curious to know what was your most important takeaway from the experience of your education? You know, what have you never forgotten from your courses and your classes and your teachers that, that you keep in practice and you keep in mind? Well, two things. There's uh, one thing that has to do with the academics. And the other things has to do with the people. The, the things that has to do with academics, I all the time thought about filmmaking as like you just turn on the camera. I've never thought about like uh, that it's that there is something <laughs> deeper behind it, like uh, the story and the structure of the story and the context of the story you're going to, to tell and all of these things. I, uh, for me, it was just I thought it was purely technical. But then uh, during my studies, I thought uh, I figured out that it's it's more of an intellectual affair more than if it than it's technical. Uh, the other thing was meeting meeting people. I mean, uh, one of the like uh, one of the people I met there who was my teacher. He's he became my best friend until this day. That was uh, fifteen years ago. <laughs> so. Wow, there's a benefit you wouldn't have expected otherwise. Yeah. Also wanted to mention for our audience's information that you are an avid backpacker, which of course is right up our alley here at the Abram Path. And we will show you, our, our audience, Samir's film on a big backpacking trip he took a little bit later in this show. But first, let's watch that short film you made in 2020. This is a personal film, Samir. Uh, you made quarantine, curfew, and videotapes to tell part of your family history and with it, a larger story about your community. Would you say a few words to introduce this film? 
Sure. Uh, well, during the quarantine, I, uh, me and my family were watching some old tapes. And somehow while watching, I was like, wait a second. There are something in on, on those tapes. Sounds like it's like the quarantine is familiar to what was happening while I was fil while uh, like on that time of w when these tapes were filmed which was like mostly the curfew and the second intifada. And I was like, and then I got this- And when uh, was that? That was the 1990s, uh, 2000s? Uh, yeah, uh, late 90s, uh, early 2000s. Mm -hmm. So I, I got like, during the quarantine, I got an email from a, a, a film uh, company. They, they wanted uh, like uh, fi filmmakers from Palestine to, create short films to tell the quarantine story. Like, uh, and I was like, okay, yeah, that's the story I want to tell. So, um, and that's how it's, uh, how it was made. So, yeah. so beginning in 2020, the worldwide pandemic, this is one of the creative projects that came from Samir Kumsia, quarantine, curfew, and videotapes. Sometimes life feels like it's repeating itself. And what you think belonged only to the past, you realize that it's still living in you in the present. Actually, rather it's what shaped who you are today. So during the quarantine time, I found myself nostalgic for watching some of the old family VHS tapes that was filmed in the late 90s and early 2000s. Little I knew that I was about to revisit a past I thought was long forgotten. In 1998, after his retirement, my grandfather bought a new home camera to record our family moments especially because my younger sister was newly born at that time. And as long as I can remember, he carried the camera all the time and documented everything. That's 11-year-old me, by the way. Well, life was good. Until, all of a sudden, things went crazy. The second intifada, or the uprising, had started. And we found ourselves dealing with a totally new unexpected reality, with daily nearby crossfire and series of invasions and curfews. My father lost his job due to the political turmoil and our financial situation started to become unstable. And then, as all of what was going on wasn't enough, my grandfather died, unexpectedly. He was there, suddenly he was gone. He left us. He left us with sadness and pain. He left us with fear and nightmares. And he also left his camera. And that camera somehow called for me. I probably felt that I needed to try to use it in an attempt to relive some of the lost moments. To relive the experience of having someone carrying the camera around documenting our lives. Though what the camera used to capture was somehow different from this sad reality it's capturing now. It's becoming clear to me as I watch these tapes today how I thought of the camera at that time as something that could protect me from the painful reality. I can see now how I believed that as long as I was seeing the world through the viewfinder, as long as I was recording, as long as I was saving those moments, I was invincible. Because for me it felt like that the reality cannot penetrate me, 
because the reality is in front of the camera, not behind it. I knew that the footage in those tapes are immortal, and that's what mattered. This idea became my shield. The surprising thing for me is that I just realized that I am doing the exact same thing today, almost 20 years later, finding ways to deal with the new reality, finding myself eager to create videos to make sense of the situation, videos that can be a testimony to a reality we once lived. Probably that's what filmmaking is all about for me, a medicine, a therapy. Maybe that's how we function as humans. We adapt. We use tools in our disposal. We constantly search for a meaning to our suffering. I believe that with every traumatic experience, there is always a lesson that can be learned. And I think that the lesson I learned was appreciation. Appreciation for the blessings of today because we never know what tomorrow might bring. for sharing yourself like that. Um, it's a real privilege to be able to become part of your personal story through observing that. I wonder, what does it take to share that depth of, of your love for your grandfather and the pain that followed and the, and the civil unrest and what that did to you and your family? Uh. For me, it feels like a catharsis. I don't know. It's like uh, it's a way to uh, kind of say things that I'm usually sh or some somehow like some sometimes shy to share and like one on one. So it's like uh, for me, I feel like more free to share uh, things that I want to say through the <laughs> like as a, a video or a film or something like that. It's easier. As you and said, in the more like, uh, it, I mean, I can, for example, tell these stories to someone in front of me. I don't think it's gonna impact them emotionally the same as if it's like uh, a combined with the with the with the footages, a combined with the the music, uh, uh, and edit, edited in a way to convey those feelings. So yeah. So there's still a protective layer there for you, as you said. The camera seemed to be a, a barrier between you and the reality that you were experiencing. Exactly. Yeah, it was, it has always been like that. Well, I think a lot of us would like to have a barrier like that sometimes because it's, it's difficult to, life isn't easy, you know, not necessarily easy even for those of us who have an easy life, like I do. I wanna share with you some of the comments we're seeing from our viewers out there, beautiful film, tears of joy. Thank you, Samir. So these are some of the notes coming in from Thank you, everyone. So I'm interested in in um, in a couple of things. One is like technically the that series of split screens that was that you had with the brushing, washing hands and you know, pushing something up against the camera. So you had to go through a lot of 
found footage, a lot of archival footage and choose scenes, did those others happen because you made them happen or did those happen naturally as well? Yeah, there are, I think, um, three or four shots, they were uh, uh, actually like not, not choreographed, they were real. And I was like, oh, wait, it's <laughs> like, and also like that idea that things are connected uh, started to happen because I, I like found this connection in the footage. And then I I saw these moments, for example, when my sister puts the the cookie in front of the lens or something. Uh, I said, okay, let's let's recreate these. It would be interesting. So yeah, and then I filmed myself waving. <laughs> and, yeah. I thought that was really a, a, a clever use of the medium of film, uh, and and fortunately on a home uh, editing system, you can do that kind of uh, video manipulation now. Yeah. In my time, Samir, to be a camera person, you had to do a lot of work, private work, be trained, be hired by CBS News or whatever company it was. You had an audio person working separately with you and the edit room was a huge room filled with equipment and a professional editor who was possibly the most expensive part of the entire production team. And you did all of these roles on your own? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, even yep. the... <laughs> the conversion of the VHS tapes into digital. It was a hassle, actually. I like I needed to find a way to to make two totally different systems to talk to each other. And I was like finding like so rare uh, and old uh, players and then old cables and finding like uh, converters to those cables to go with something that could work on a computer and stuff like these. And, it, and I installed all the <laughs> softwares and so I can get those tapes to, 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 to digitize them. So yeah, it was, it was a hassle, but yeah, I mean like that's, that's how I do it all. Like uh, th that's how I, I work mostly. Despite because you have to, you have yeah, exactly. to. <laughs> because I don't have, uh, for example, the money to hire someone that could do it. So I, I find my way to do it myself. And that's well, how I do like, most of my films. Yeah. Sure. And, and isn't there an advantage to that too? Because then you get to see what the story is and you get to tell the story that you see. It's nice to get some funding for that. It's nice to be, re uh, to be compensated for it. But... Um, one of the things that I've noticed since our, you know, our phones have become cameras is, and everyone has noticed, it's not just me, that, you know, how, how democratized storytelling has become. And I'm wondering if you talk about how you see the impact of these, the ability to tell the, a story immediately and personally with your own equipment. How has that changed what we see? in terms of stories coming out of where you live uh, from and from other, uh, say, more remote places. What's the difference now that people can tell their own stories? The Visually. difference is, um, is great. I mean, I think this is an, um, this is an awesome invention, to be honest. I'm, I'm like, uh, I know that the social media and all of these things, they have their negative side, but uh, I usually like to focus on the positive side of things. I think this is a, this is like an, an an awesome invention because it gave like a platform for people who basically were voiceless. Like you get like in, in in the past you needed to like convince so many people until you can make your film or something like that to be shown to a specific kind of audience that those people will want to show or those people like the production companies and stuff like that they had their own, they have their own visions they have their own agendas but now you can do whatever you want and uh, like uh, you can put your uh, a film on on youtube and it can be seen by uh, hundreds of thousands of people or millions of people sometimes so and that's one side of it and the other side is the filming technologies 
have became accessible as you said you can you can now make a feature film with your phone you don't need the, the expensive equipment and the cameras and all these kind of things and that raised the challenge for 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 filmmakers to come up with better ideas and better stories uh, so you can because now the technology is available how can you draw attention to what you want to do, to do. so you you must make a, a better story or fi or find a story or a, something that's already existing but come come at it in a different perspective well, you've raised two points one is the is the fact that the the stories can be told and how wonderful that is <laughs> and that people have to come up with stories that will capture attention you have to come up with a better story and figure out the technology to make it told. The other half of that is getting it seen. How do you do that part? How do you get people to notice your work? Well, it, it hasn't been easy. I still, I mean, like, uh, for, for example, like now with, <laughs> you can see like on TikTok, like these kind of, uh, you know, like, uh, viral videos or something like they actually has no real content it's just pure entertainment they have like millions of views uh, but when you do something that's uh, like more uh, intellectually challenging let's say uh, it doesn't uh, uh, draw much attention to people because i mean like in, in my opinion i think people usually tend to use internet to to relieve themselves from the stressful life so they don't want us to show them more stressful things and that's what i'm trying to do like i'm trying to like i have like two principles when i make a film like first like okay even if my films are somehow political or like uh, they have some intellectual kind of uh, ideas in them about palestine and our life but I, I had to make the film first thing it should uh, uh, it should be kind of entertaining like or like emo emotionally engaging and the other thing it should be understandable like uh, not just statistics statistics and and data and stuff like that it mm -hmm. should be personal like people should relate to it and that's what I've been trying to do uh, it's uh, I mean, I've learned so many things about how social media works and how the algorithm works and all of these kind of things. I still didn't, I could not make it 100%, but at least uh, yeah, I, I got some, some views, some engagements. People wrote to me from all over the world. The film has been seen to more than, to more people than I expected. So it's great. Well, let's put your website in our chat so that even more people can take a look at your work and begin to follow you. I'm sure uh, you have Facebook, Instagram. More active on Instagram, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, we'll get that information to our audience so that that you can all enjoy some uh, follow Samir. <laughs> cool. We choose our guests because you have something to offer that we want to share with a global audience. As we said, you're an avid backpacker and you've written that you believe international travel is a way for cultural understanding and building bridges between people. <clears throat> we believe this too at the Abraham Path, absolutely, Samir. So I wanted to ask you, uh, what do you see as the power of slow travel? Because backpacking is slow travel. Yeah, uh, the most important thing I would say is that you form uh, personal relationships. That's that's like that's the I would say the grand or the main idea that I got from like traveling for almost ten years or so. It's it's the personal relationships that you 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 uh, start with people when you travel. And through their eyes, you can understand their uh, their lives. You can understand their cultures and all of that. So, um, yeah, 
that's so you cannot do that if you just uh, travel let's say uh, as a tourist for a couple of days or you just go see the um, you know the the landmarks or like the the museums and these kind of things i mean i have nothing against them i i when i travel i go to the museums and these kind of things uh, i love that experience but uh, uh, there are like if you go to to a country the most important thing in my opinion it's that it's the people not not the stones <laughs> so that that's what i think is is what's important with slow traveling because you had to stay there for a while and deal with people and know people i love that it's the people and not the stones absolutely well let's we have a question for you here from raju bats uh which refers back to the quarantine and curfew film we just saw he asks how does your family feel about the service and sharing uh work that you are doing they <laughs> they loved it they love it Uh, especially with the film that showed part of their lives like uh, when i showed them showed showed them the film they were all crying i was like <laughs> why am i not crying like that but i think uh, yeah it's uh, yeah it was so emotional uh, like it was emotional like it was really uh, as i said in the film it was therapeutic for me I mean it has been like I worked on it for maybe two months or so I was in in a totally different uh, how can I say this I was like in a diff I was in a different stage emotionally when I was doing that when I was making that film but it was also another um another stage emotionally when I showed the film to my family it was like Oh, like I, I kind of realized that I saw the external expression of that of the impact that the film had made on me so through the through the emotions they expressed when they were watching the film. So yeah, I I also felt kind of uh, um, relieved, I would say, because uh, I felt like I also showed them the hopeful side of what happened. 20 years ago it's kind of like i felt like i was helping them and there was also like uh, the other family members that are not immediate but they were like in the neighborhood the friends and uh, and the neighbors like also like i felt like i was connecting with them again like it was like we had all this intimate connection when we were kids and now like we don't speak usually and when they saw the film like they all wrote comments or sent the uh, messages uh, it was like connecting with with them it was nice that may be the downside of our internet culture and the easy access to our cameras on our phones is that we're not speaking to each other quite as much as we used to we don't have to have that voice connection let alone the uh you know face to face connection yeah yeah exactly so yeah as i say it uh, i yeah people don't speak to each other as they used to so let's use the technology that broke that had broken that uh, connection let's use it to reconnect so that's i think my principle now yeah yeah we have a comment here from uh ifet ogonsul from turkey He says i agree with you samir people are more interesting than stones yeah so we're here well, with that Well, as we said, you are an avid backpacker, and you took your love of pack backpacking and made a film with themes of travel and confinement. It's a parallel a question. The film is called Walled Citizen, and Walled Citizen won the 2022 Sardegna Palestina Award at Al Ard Documentary Film Festival. It won the Premio Sortia di Giovanni Invisibile at the 2020 Terra dei Tutti Film Festival, which is Italian Best Film by a Young Filmmaker, and was also nominated for Best Documentary of Palestine Cinema Days in 2019. And we're going to show you the trailer because 
walled citizen, uh, unlike quarantine and curfew, which is only six minutes or so long, walled citizen is quite a bit longer. Samir, would you tell us a bit about walled citizen before we look at the trailer? It's a feature film, which is like uh, it's uh, more than an hour. So uh, it was available and uh, online for streaming, but. Uh, due to the expiration of the contract now it's not available unfortunately but uh, i'm i'm trying to make it available again my suggestion was that i'll put it on youtube for free for everyone to watch it but um, many of my producer friends they were against this idea so uh, <laughs> uh, we will see maybe like in the next couple of weeks i make my decision and and just put it on YouTube. Anyway, so yeah, this film, um, I started filming it in early 2016 uh, during my peak time of traveling. <laughs> uh, I was feeling really, really depressed and I felt like I was in, a, in prison because uh, um, I used to meet so much, so many internationals who are travelers uh, and they like when they talk about the way they travel I was like wait a minute but, but this does not sound like me because I cannot just like pack my back and travel like every time I wanted to travel it's like months of <laughs> preparations and uh, uh, loads and loads of paperwork uh, uh, so I, I decided I said okay let's not just complain about it let's make a film about it and that's that's how it started so i filmed for three years i traveled for three years on and off and i made a film about it so yeah i have a dream to travel the world but people think i'm detached from reality because this is the reality i live in palestine and my life is surrounded by walls and i carry one of the world's weakest ranking passports but despite of this, I decided to challenge those walls, grabbed my camera, and attempted to travel the world in search for freedom. We are living in the same planet. We must help each other, just like family. يعني هذا الكرة الأرضية شايف ليش يجي حدا يمنعك وين تروح؟ الحرية شفامين. Curiosity is one of the things that human beings have. Challenges, new things to learn, new places to discover, the new cultures to come across. The planet is wide. When you're backpacking, you're living like a local. You see things that I guess maybe your government or your society doesn't want you to see. Once you meet someone, you say you're an immigrant. It's like you just built a wall between you and this person. You're staying in your apartment and you just watch your TV and you only know this little bubble. You're scared of everyone else. I had a very important trip here. It was so unexpected. Uh. <laughs> I think all problem that people don't know each other. All problem. In this situation, we can see how important are freedom of movement. Quite a different feel in this film, Samir, from the other one. It's amazing to think you you actually released them both. In, uh, in 2020. They're both autobiographical, right? But the first one, you use a lot of found material, archival material. You, you pulled from the past and from existing material. This one, you basically generated everything fresh and new, didn't you? Yep. <laughs> yep. And I know, I know that experience, both of those search for the, for the old and using the new. What was that like for you, putting together a film? from all created uh, original material it wasn't that fun to be honest uh, it, it took a year 
full year to to assemble those footages because I mean I, I filmed as I said for three years uh, and I filmed everything literally everything even when I wasn't traveling I, I used to film <laughs> things happening in Palestine or film my thoughts or like something these these kind of things and at some point I even like started like the reality between which is the, the film and which is the reality uh, became blurred I did not even know what I was doing but uh, then then with all of these mat material I needed to come up with uh, a co coherent storyline uh, and, uh, and a storyline that it's, it's not like six hour long movie <laughs> so yeah the, the editing part of this film wa wasn't the technical it was more of the how like how to structure the film in a way that can make sense and again i think where where this film and the quarantine film meet is the personal story i was like wait a second forget about everything what is your story what actually happened with me in 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 my heart during my travels and that's where I found the story, where I found the structure of that film, because I, I, I followed what actually happened to me and how I changed from I was depressed and I wanted to escape Palestine and travel the world to escape the problems from Palestine to get to a point the, to see the bigger, the bigger picture of, of meeting the people I've met during the three years and how, how backpacking is a, is a, is, is a tool to build bridges uh, and so the film is what happened between those two points and you put to use certainly the what you had learned in your experience at Dar al Kalima which is the structure and looking at how can you actually tell a story and not just throw images on the screen and expect people to watch them and and enjoy them the way you experienced them as you were filming them and it is hard to cut out footage that you love and storylines yeah. that you love and people that you met along the way that you love and they just can't be in a, the finished product. Exactly, yeah, it happened. Uh, some people, I mean, I, I wrote to the people who like whose, whose their stories did not make it in the film. I wrote to them a thank you message and I explained mm -hmm. Uh, most of them, they were fine about it. I, I mean, all of them, they were fine about it, but some jokingly ma made some har hard time for me. And, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, yeah, but again, I was like, I needed to to think of what I wanted to say in this film. Um, and I didn't, and, and, but I, I in, and at the end of the film, in the end credit, I, I put... Um, um uh, uh, text to thank those people because i i wanted to honor their time i wanted to because i i really respect that they opened their heart to me and talked to me and shared their stories with me and i didn't want to just uh, you know okay they they don't fit in the story let's let's take take it away i wanted to honor and appreciate their time um so yeah but at the end of the day i was thinking that um if taking the, those scenes away or th those lines or those some of the characters in the film, like the, if I take them away, it will make the story more understandable, let's say, and and more precise, which will help the bigger cause at the end of the day. So that's right. The maturing of a filmmaker, I, re I, I know that feeling. It looks to, like from the, um, I have seen the whole film, but I wanted to say that you actually ended up having people that you met abroad come to Palestine. How did that happen? Yeah, uh, that's uh, that's kind of the, the whole point of this film. <laughs> It's. Uh, I mean, I, I also don't, don't want to give, give it away, but basically, Simply, it's that the film starts where I complain that people come from all over the world 
and they come to Palestine and we meet them, but they leave. It, it For me, at that time, it felt like I'm just a station in their ongoing adventure. Like, uh, it's just they come with a, on a train, they they stop for a couple of days in, in, in this station, they make connections with me and we we make this um, relationship or whatever and then they leave and i stay where I, where i am uh, for me that idea was so depressing but by the end of the movie i <laughs> the whole idea changed for me i started to see that when 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 the people when my friend from outside comes to see to see us in palestine they it's an actual. It's actually an an act of activist. Like it's an activist. Uh, uh, an intentional uh, statement. It is. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's it's like it's not just something that um, th that has to meet to do with me personally. It's uh, it has it has a bigger cause, as I said before. It's uh, it, it's an uh, revolutionary act, let's say, because it's also for for them. Like, okay, maybe I need to give up some, some, uh, because like uh, I, I met a Ukrainian couple in, uh, in Denmark and we became like really close friends. Uh, they did not know anything about Palestine, literally nothing. Like the only thing they knew about us is that we are terrorists because they saw some Hollywood film <laughs> and that's the only thing. So, and they had like these, um, um, presuppositions about us like we are you know like all Muslims uh, whereas I'm, I'm coming from a Christian background but, uh, and also like they they thought that it's just a, like in, okay Palestine yeah Middle East then it's just uh, oppressing women war problems and that's the, the idea they had and because we uh, like me and and the the, uh, the guy Max we became close friends because we had a common love for adventure because we, we were like uh, backpackers so and then we created this uh, intimate relationship like we we became like really close friends so and then they decided to come here and when they came here like their whole uh, vision their whole idea their whole uh, stereotypical ideas about us they, it's just disappeared like again that's uh, that, that's part of what the film is about it's not just about the physical walls also the, about the walls we put in my in our hearts and our minds you know so these walls got torn down in them and they they saw the reality here they saw the reality of what's happening in palestine and for me that was way way better idea than my idea before that I'm just stationed and uh, I like uh, feel bad about uh, not not being able to travel with them again. So, yeah, it's I hope that, one, that made sense. <laughs> it does totally. One of our themes at Abraham Path Initiative is to foster friendships across the challenging divides of our time. And you've done that with your film and with your presence and with your physical travel being there slow travel you were able to create that we have a comment from uh raju here he says this was for you he sees an amazing transformative process and he says your courage to face yourself samir is inspiring nice beautiful thank you <laughs> yes so um i love i love getting personally i just love hearing the depth of the experience, it helps me to grow and also to remember some of my own favorite uh, times in the field. In um, 2020, uh, we knew that people were not going to be going to Bethlehem at Christmas, sort of taking what you're talking about, the quarantine and flipping it. And so what we did was bring Bethlehem to people online. We hired two natives of Bethlehem, a tour guide, Hazem Banura, and camera person, Noor Hodali. I don't know if you and Noor may have worked together in some Yeah, places. we did. Yes, yeah. yes. So we created what we called a live online tour. 
they led the tour at a moment in time and people joined online from all over the world, from Brazil, from Germany, from LA, New York, London, Paris. Uh, and they took us through Bethlehem. We were the only international visitors to Bethlehem in 2020. And so we're going to put that uh, link to that in the in the online chat for for our, our visitors. The reason I raise it is because as I was preparing uh, for that, and as I looked at doing it again for with the Abraham Path in 2021, uh, I came across an extraordinary piece by a young man named Samir Kumsi. And this is your offering of what is Bethlehem. And you put it to the, to the wonderful Christmas Carol of a little town of Bethlehem. Um, I wanted to, that's what we're going to show uh, you, our audience, as the closing clip for this uh, webinar today. Uh, but that's what led me to find you in the first place, Samir, who was this very uh, meaningful piece, which in distinction from quarantine curfew and uh, walled citizen, it's, it's fiction in a sense. It's not documentary. Would you, again, without giving it all away because our audience will stay and watch it, what was the concept for, for this film? Well, I stumbled upon an image I think, I don't know, like more than 10 years ago, uh, showing uh, Joseph and Mary trying to come to Bethlehem. Uh, and there was the, the wall and uh, there was a soldier trying to check their papers. Um, and I was like thinking, yeah, like uh, this, is, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is Bethlehem, like um, millions of people, uh, the Christians, they believe uh, Jesus wa uh, was born here. But do they actually know the reality of, of, uh, of Bethlehem today, in, like in, in our modern times? Like, uh, do they think it's like a, a fictional place or do they think that it's still this uh, like mountain with no people there? Or I don't, I don't know, like I did not. So I wanted to do something that kind of mix these these like Bethlehem as as mentioned in the Bible and Bethlehem of of today's world which is a, a place that one there are people who are uh, celebrating the Christmas there there are Palestinian Christians living in Bethlehem and the second idea is that it's surrounded by a wall. It's also under occupation. It's also like those people who are living there, they also uh, have problems with the occupation, the same as like they are they are Palestinians. So, uh, and me being me, I wanted to do something that's artistic, not just to tell these pieces of information or something. So I I had the idea of uh, the. Uh, the Santa, <laughs> like, uh, uh, because like every year, like people cele celebrate Christmas and there's a Christmas market and the whole city is l lit um, and uh, we have the Christmas tree and all of that. It's like a joyful atmosphere. So I wanted to contrast that with the, the other reality, which is the, the wall and the, the political problems. So I thought, Let's let's bring a Santa there, and go to the Christmas market and film the the beautiful lights and the smiles and all of these beautiful things, and then let's show kind of like the <laughs> like the 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 dark uh, side behind that thing, which is uh, the wall, and that uh, you you see for like. I think for the first time that Santa is actually so sad, <laughs> and uh, and it was yeah, yeah. I think I. That's how how I I thought I want, I want to convey 
my feelings about the, about being Christian in, in Palestine, too, especially from Bethlehem. And what kind of response have you gotten to that piece, Samir? <laughs> As most of my, uh, my videos on YouTube, it's like 99% of the responses are positive. Uh, people love this, uh, this uh, video. Um, yeah, uh, most of them, they, they understood what I'm trying to say. And uh, they, they thought it's brilliant. They thought it's, uh, it, shows, uh, it, it shows the happy side and the negative side. Um, but uh, yeah, as usual, <laughs> there will be like one percent of people who, yeah, like I got, I think I got a comment. It's like someone said, uh, um, I'm I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> it's like uh, if you stop the bombing, there's there would be no need for the wall. I was like, okay. Mm -hmm. We're bombing every every day, and so I I don't know. Yeah, so these kind of people who like I think they are just uh, uneducated or like uh, they are just brainwashed or something like that. They don't want to seek the truth. Uh, I don't know. So I I think my films or any work of art that anyone do, I don't think it's gonna affect this those specific people. Uh, I think that. <laughs> Well, you never know. You never know for them and for the rest of us. You know, your films are making a difference and having an impact. Uh, yeah. Would you summarize what what may be next for you? Well, so I think it it was like a journey that led me to this realization that I need to make films or 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 short films or any like video art that shows Palestine as uh, I don't want to say normal in a sense of it because it's we don't live in a normal circumstances but but to see people as relatable people like normal people they have like uh, you know they have ambitions they have goals in their lives they 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 love they they have passions they have <laughs> they look forward to a better day or and and this is uh, like I'm trying to uh, now I'm developing a web series with ten ten short uh, um, episodes that features artists, scientists, and uh, entrepreneurs like uh, all of them Palestinians to show that to show that side to show a relatable story that uh, that people around the world can can see us. Uh, as 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 people who are wanting to live, they are not just people being killed, which I think, in in my opinion, that that would be the first step to for, to liberation. Actually, which is that when people around the world see us, like if let's say, okay, I don't want to speak for long, but. Like when I showed World Citizen, when World Citizen was selected in in one of the most famous film festivals that has to do with traveling, like it shows traveling films and like mountain films. Uh, it, it was the first time that that festival shows a film from Palestine, and 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 like I got like tons of messages from the people who saw the film there. They were like, we never expected to see an adventure movie from Palestine. So that that created the connection with those people, like those backpackers. Now they know that there are backpackers in Palestine. Next time when they see in the news that Palestinians are being killed, they would say, oh, the backpackers in Palestine are being killed. So there, there's a connection now. Because if, if they see us only as people being killed, then they think, okay, okay, Palestinians, they were born to be killed, so it's okay. <laughs> but now they, they will not think that. They will think a backpacker is being killed, an artist is being killed, a friend is being killed, you know, like, and that's what, what in my opinion, will, will, will make the world understand the, the oppression we are living and the, 
the difficult circumstances we are living, they will understand it in a personal level more than in a political level or statistics or stuff like that. So. Well, Samir, uh, thank you for your creativity and for your attention and for the beautiful Oh Little Town of Bethlehem film that we're going to close our program with in just a minute. Uh, but before we go, I want to remind our viewers that Abraham Path Initiative is a US-based not-for-profit. We bring you online programs as part of our mission to introduce people and cultures from Southwest Asia, commonly known as the Middle East, to our growing international audience. If you like what we're doing, this is the time of year to make a tax deductible gift. Please go to our website, www.abrahampath.org and click donate. Your holiday gift will help sustain our work in 2023. Our gratitude to the many Abraham Path supporters who have tuned into today's program. We couldn't do it without you. We're so grateful to Samir Komsia for joining us for the gift of his films, those that he's already made and those to come in what we hope may be a long and productive career. I'm Anissa Mehdi, and for all of us at the Abraham Path Initiative, thank you for joining us. Happy holidays and happy new year. Peace.